Cause like a winter Welcome and thank you for joining us. This is the Circle of Insight show, a show about everything in human behavior. But today we're going to be dealing with sharks. I'm Dr. Carlos. With us today is Joe Romero, Shark Week cinematographer and expert. And he's going to be telling us today about sharks and their behavior. And we're going to throw a little bit of human behavior in there. We're going to find out what's this fascination we have with sharks. Are they as dangerous? Do they even care about us as much as we care about them? Well, we're going to figure all this out, so let's welcome to the circle, Joe Romero. How are you, Joe? <laughs> How you doing? Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So before we get into all the fun stuff with sharks, uh, I have to learn a little bit more about you. So where are you from? Well, I'm originally from the Azores, and when I was three years old, I moved over here to uh, New England, and I've lived here in Rhode Island for most of my life. Now, how did you go from Rhode Island to sharks? Um, there's sharks here in Rhode Island. We saw sharks this week. I'm planning on going out this week again to go see more sharks. Really? There, yeah, there's a huge population that migrates here during the summertime. And there's 31 different species. There's blue sharks, mako sharks, threshers, white sharks, everything. Bass oh, wow. sharks, quite a bit, of, quite a lot of the, you know, the, especially the cold water species. And what gets you fascinated about studying sharks? Um, it was when I was a little kid. I came over here when I was three or something. I couldn't really speak English, so everything I saw was like nature documentaries, and I saw Jaws, you know, I was terrified. And the nature documentaries, though, managed to pull me around. They, like, managed to change me as a human being. I really felt that there was a... There were people there that had worked on Jaws, even in those nature documentaries that I, I hold so dear to my heart that they, they, they've grown in such a way that the admiration that everybody has for them as far as what they've accomplished and what they've done has just been something that like was in me. It kind of felt like almost kind of climbing to the top of a mountain or hitting that. It, it was just, it was something that I felt like was a, a life goal of mine, but probably, you know, as everybody assumes, you know, you, you, you do these goals and you're not sure exactly where they'll take you. Yeah. So, I mean, you when know, most the, of when was the first time you actually went in the water with a shark? Oh, I, um, well, I worked here in Rhode Island as an artist, you know, I, I drew a lot of sharks. I did stuff like that. Started scuba diving. I always been in the water and then it just started, uh, connecting. Like once I, I, I found there was like, uh, there were people like me that wanted to go out and see sharks. We like got together and we, we combined out, we went out and saw them. I mean, I saw my first one when I was a, when I was a child and I would see them all the time fishing and other things, but I never got in the water with one. So when I finally did, and it was like a blue and a mako shark that uh, that ultimately changed it for me. I mean, my New England friends, the guys that live here on Rhode Island, I have a really close friend that like got me into the diving and stayed with me throughout a lot of it. We traveled to Fiji together and did sharks there. And uh, through then, I just started getting bigger and bigger cameras. It started off with a little small camera, and then... Uh, you know, after a while, I had committed to diving in such a way that I, I wanted to do this all the time. So I found a way to like get another camera. I mean, I basically had, uh, just didn't get a car. <laughs> you know, I had one. I was like, this is good enough. I'm not going to get a car. I'm just going to get a camera. So I ended up getting a camera and I moved up year after year to the point where we're now shooting like large systems and doing the stuff we have to. I mean, it, you, you have to know your cameras nowadays at Shark Week because everybody is so advanced on this stuff. There's so many guys that are so talented and doing so many things that are so wide that it's hard to keep up. It's hard to like make something new that people are going to look at and it's going to change their perceptions of everything. You know, not only just, you know, not only just bringing all the science facts and everything else through cool stories and, you know, how adventurous everything is and everything, but also, you know, showing you guys cool stuff that sharks do. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, all these animals have evolved in their own way to do these specialized hunting techniques and everything. There's so many different species of shark besides just the great white. Yeah, you know? well, you're talking about some of those. I know that. 
Let me ask you this question. Um, what got you involved in studying them? I mean, you, you went with them. Did you go first go in a cage or did you just jump in the water with them? Um, I started like just getting into them and studying them. Like, I think it, it was just, I started talking to uh, some South Florida scientists and I have some really good friends there. I mean, there's an excellent uh, doctor that works down there named Neil Hammerschlag that I befriended when we were like, you know, first starting out and Neil had just started getting his, uh, his PhD in it and everything. He's super knowledgeable about sharks. Like we could talk about sharks for hours and I started, uh, researching things with them and, uh, we'd go out, we did the first ever bull shark. We did the, you know, we satellite tagged the first ever scallop hammerhead during one of my dives, you know, we, wow. we and Neil would get in and dive with me and all this stuff. And we, you know, I, I grew a lot of friends in the, that community and also up here in North, we have a ton of amazing scientists. We have Greg Skomel, who's like, you know, top of his game in white sharks down here. And he's like probably in the world, but they've all become really good friends and they've all like, you know, I've been able to share this passion with them, but I've also been able to go out and see them study research with them and, and help find out new things about them. And they're always very, you know, like we're all excited together, like we're kids, you know, it's like, remember that thing we did last week, this is what it, the results were, and we're the first people to know that, you know, it feels like, you know, you're looking at that in the water, and you kind of look at two or three sharks, you got to wonder, like, who on the planet seen that, and I think the same thing with research, like, who on the planet knows that, and there's so many passionate people that want to be able to educate people into knowing they're sharks. And I think like this year, Shark Week's doing an amazing job of keeping uh, things so wide based in all different species of sharks and, you know, really expanding the gamut and, and, and pushing conservation, which they have an amazing platform to do so. Because lots of people, you know, tune in and then they see that, you know, people care about sharks and it changes their whole perceptions on things. It changes the world. And it's, it's amazing what a small group of people can influence That's and I think nice. that you know there's people here at Shark Week that are just so amazing at that at doing it you know and they know what they want they know what the sharks uh plight is and they they feel for it you know and I, I see that in them and I I love working with these guys you know and your show's coming out tomorrow night if I remember correctly Wednesday yes All yes right. Wednesday. So yeah. let's start delving into some of these sharks. <clears throat> My daughter, as some of us know, she's a huge fan of sharks. She's five years old. But yeah. uh, she's already got uh, the names down. She knows about eight or nine of these species. So do uh, you want me to ask you the types of sharks that she's curious about? Or would you want to talk about the ones that you studied for the recent Shark Week? Or uh, uh, you can talk to me about anything shark. Okay. So I know when we were reading a book, the, I think it was the bull shark is not a very friendly one. Is that correct? Well, the bull shark has a, an extreme reputation just because of this animal's ability. Like this animal is going to come into contact more with humans than any other shark species because it forages near shore. It's one of these powerful sharks that have, a, you know, the, the most amazing ability to be strong. You know, the, these sharks, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess the best way to describe it is like you look at certain shark species and you look at other ones and it's kind of like in the dog species world. You know, you, you can have a chihuahua and that thing could be the meanest dog you ever laid eyes on and then you can have a German shepherd and it would be the nicest dog you ever had. Every, every shark has their own personality. It's just what the equipment is. And a bull shark, you know, sometimes when it investigates things or does things, it's so primitive in nature that it just, you know, it, it can exert a lot of uh, amount of energy to do what it has to do. And it, you know, it's unfortunately they have a, an amazing set of equipment to do so. So the, pretty strong. He, they are one of the most strongest species. They're one of the ones we have, you know, respect for when we're filming them. They're, they're, they're definitely, they look like most sharks, you know, they just have a very average shark look to them. You know, if, what people think of shark, they usually think white shark or this sort of species of shark. They don't really think of all the over 500 different species of shark and all the amazing things they do and things we're figuring out they do. There's 500 of them? Over 500 over now. Over 500, wow. Yeah. wow. Okay, well, we'll start slow with my daughter on that one. So on the bull shark, I mean, do they get upset when you guys are around? I mean, do they look at you going, what's going on here? They're never upset. I mean, they never. They're, I mean, everything with a bull shark and us is always 
if there's an aggression towards people, it's it's always mistaken identity. These animals don't naturally oh. hunt humans. They don't go all season without people and then all of a sudden go, oh, we got them. You know, they <laughs> they they forge near the show are usually in bad visibility in estuaries, rivers, things like that. They bump into su- stuff to see what it is. They use this complex array of sensors in the front of their face. They can uh, detect minute electrical signatures in the water. So they'll go and they'll touch things like humans or you know, fish or whatever, and just kind of sense that in the area. And once they've seen that they've close, they quickly bite to see what it is, you know, or, or, I mean, usually that's what, that's what happens. I mean, that's not like, it, it's always investigatory. Sometimes they're a little bit more intense because there's a, a competition between animals. You know, if you ever throw a piece of fish and I mean, a piece of fish or a piece of bread in the water and you see all fish go at it at once, you got to understand they're not making good decisions, you know, like they're just <laughs> they're going things. So they, when do they have bad eyesight too, right? Or no, they, they, all sharks have a really, what, from what they've studied, they find that their eyesight is different than what we once thought, but they do see at night, you know, and they do see a lot of things that they have the ability to see better underwater than we do. Definitely. And, wow. and at large distances, I've noticed that sharks can see, very well, you know, and in bad visibility, everything, they sense things, you know, but we, we once gave them no credit for their eyesight. And now they're, we found out that their eyesight's really good. You know, it has the same, if you flash a flashlight into a cat's eyes, you see that reflection. That's like tatum lucidum. It's a type of, you know, fluid that exists in the eye to be able to uh, refract it and do all night vision and stuff. So you'd be able to take in as much as you can. And uh, you do the same thing to sharks. They all have it. Fascinating. Now, let's go back a little bit because I know, I think I saw you in an interview on CNN a couple of days ago. Yeah. And the media is kind of hyperbolizing all oh, these shark attacks everywhere. Da, 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 da. And I forgot, I think it's down in the Carolinas or um, I forgot where they had those seven attacks. Um, Escape me now. Uh, well, they've had a, like 11 along the coast of the, you know, they reported just recently 11 on the coast of the Carolinas. And uh, that's all combined between North and South Carolina. But that's a huge amount of space. And we occupy a lot of the seashore. It's, it's not like we have much space where we don't go into the water. So it, it's, it's a combination of all the Gulf Stream waters pushing up really hard. The water turns really warm. So it pushes all the animals against everything really close. They start going into smaller patches. Um, some of them use it to advantage, some of them don't, some of them try to escape it, so everything pushes really soon. The white sharks up here arrived really early this year because the water temperatures have, the Gulf Stream just traveled up at such a tremendous rate. <clears throat> and um, and the combination of people going into the water at that time, you know, into this shallow kind of murky water, and then there's fishermen sometimes around. I mean, in a lot of these, uh, I don't like to use the word attack because attack implicates that like, like implies that the animal wants to wants to do that like that's the animal's intent. I always use it as bites, you know. What or, you said on the show, it, yes, exactly. Yeah, some something to like limit because that's that's what it really is. I mean, a shark will bite, but you know they they they're judging everything. They have such sensors inside their nose. They have sensors inside their mouth. So when they take something into their mouth, they can literally taste what it is. And they see that it's a human being and they spit it out. That's why a majority of these bites are all. But that's that's no consolation to say to someone that, you know, it's dealt with that situation. And I feel like I feel for them amazingly. I feel horrible about all this stuff. I hate any kind of interaction with people that's just negative like this. But at the same time, it can be explained by science on why they're doing it. And it's not because the shark holds a vendetta. You know, they, they don't. They don't have that kind of complex emotion inside of them. They don't sit there and think like, oh, I hate humans or I'm starting to learn to eat humans. They know that like that's a big predator and that's hard. You know, it's it's not easy for them. So and they don't naturally associate it with anything. We've never evolved that way. Human beings, if we lived in the water all the time, you know, if we were just water animals and we just like sat waiting in the water and I would assume something would prey on us then, but we don't. We live on land. And for, you know, millions of years, this is where we stayed. So, I mean, it's not like we might have one day evolved from the water, but it's not like we went back. You know, we just go back as swimmers. And now it's less and less and less to the point where it's, you know, you one month out of a year, you get near the water. And you kind of go into it and up to your waist. People always ask why the sharks are 
in such shallow waters, you know, why are these things happening in three to five feet of water? I mean, these encounters happen in three to five feet of water because that's where people go. You know, no one goes into like, I'm in 175 <laughs> feet. You know, uh, so, you know, yeah. they, they come together in that moment. And then, you know, the combination of everything together can cause for a serious encounter. But in most instances, the sharks just leave and no one even knows. You I know, want, uh, I want to see if the shark expert will corroborate this too. I know as I was reading, I was really stunned to realize uh, there were only 20 shark attacks. Uh, it's the average per year in the Mar in the U.S. Is that about yeah, right? In the U.S., but in the world, it, it's different. But I mean, if you look at the world statistics of everything, it's like three to four every year. I think the highest I've, I've seen is like I think I saw once nine. I mean, I can't really be quoted on that, but wow. Um, I think that was like the most in one year. When you look at humans killing sharks, it's 70 to 100 million a year. I mean, 70 being the lowest and 100 being like their peak years that they hit. How many? And 100 million. You time it out, it's three sharks a second. Just disappear off the face of the planet. Nothing over 200 pounds can deal with that. And there's so many sharks from small ones to large ones, but they take so long to gestate. A, a shark can take, you know, a great deal of time to have their their pups and in that time it's it's a traumatic loss and we also target these animals when they're they're fully pregnant there's a lot of like fishing tournaments and see, stuff i see where you're trying to get a lot of weight usually they're taking it in the spring that's usually big females and uh taking those out of the the you know the chain of everything is just it's yeah. tragic because what happens is something balances it out and uh, here in New England, we have uh, a tremendous spiny dogfish overthrow. Like they're everywhere, these little sharks, you know, but they, you would think, oh, they're going in danger. Here, because this larger species of sharks, these pelagic ones that live offshore, feed off these sharks, these little sharks. There's not as many of them. So the little sharks have taken, you know, a higher count. But this is also bad for people that fish what the little sharks eat, you know, and it's, it's you're sitting there and you're, you're trying to catch squid or anything else and you're just catching these little sharks and that's because of this imbalance in the ocean it's not like people go oh well, one year it's like this one year it's like that no it's exceedingly getting worse that's and every year it's like well we sit in there we have huge populations of explo exploding in some areas we have populations dying in others we have water temperatures that should be here two months from when they get here i mean it, it, the season shouldn't have peaked so early where we are but, you know, it, it's it's hit a lot earlier this year because this hit of water temperature. So, I mean, you, you sit there and you're almost like watching them come in late one year and then the next year coming in really early. So they're following the water temperatures, you know, and science has proven that they are. But um, a lot of these species that do follow the water temperatures are susceptible to fishing and running across. I mean, a lot of them run across the whole coast of the United States. Some of them run other countries. So, I mean, we, we have them leave here where sometimes they're protected and some, you know, the only white shark that, that receives any kind of real protection here in the States is uh, the great white, you know, and that's really world renowned. Like there's no other sharks they're really looking at trying to do anything. At the, I mean, they're trying to do them, but they're not in place. We, we know which ones are endangered. We know which ones are red listed. Scientists are struggling to try to keep them, you know, together. I mean, in Bimini, Bahamas, they just recently found this uh, group of great hammerheads that live there and they've been running tours and scientists have been coming out and really seeing them and stuff. And it's an exciting thing because this animal was once previously thought to be like on its way out. The hammerhead? And the great hammerhead. It's about, it can grow to be 20 feet long. They normally don't reach that size, but, uh, why they're, are they designed that way? Do you know? Is there some kind of evolutionarily evolutionary explanation why their heads like that? Do they use it for some reason? Um, well, yeah, they definitely use it for some reason. It's an array of uh, sensors. I kind of like lost you know, on the, the train of thought. <laughs> I, uh, it's an array of sensors that they have, and this animal's evolved all these incredible characteristics. People think it's like a lot. Uh, primal they think it's more less evolved than other sharks like oh look at this oh, you know okay. ancient this ancient predator and it's like it's really more highly evolved than most sharks it's it's got the it's put itself in the ability of just being specialized you know it also it's grown all these 
sensory organs to go across the sand and it just kind of sweeps across the sand looking for, for, for what it looks for, it's sensing this. But it's also grown its eyes out to the side of its head, which, you know, kind of protects them. You know, if you're fight, fighting off stingrays all the time, every time you bump into one, you know, and trying to eat one, it's good to keep your eyes away from where the barbs are. So these animals that feed on these things have developed all these special, like, skills, but only, like, little sects of them have done that. You know, like, hammerheads are small little species list, you know, there's, and then thresher sharks is, like, three, you know, every uh, makos, there's, like, two different species of makos that look definitely different, like they all do. And the big thing about these sharks that have these highly evolved skills like hammerheads and um, um, thresher sharks and mako sharks and all these different like animal like that have these specialized natures about them is that they become very specialized on one food source like basking sharks, you know, specialize in just eating plankton and small fish and stuff like that. But um, a lot of them have developed these skills to be able to catch things and do things that other ones haven't. And the basking shark is actually a pretty darn big fish. If you take out their prey sources, it's huge. It's 30 feet long. You know, it's an amazingly large animal. It's the second largest fish on the planet. Yep. It's, uh, <laughs> they kind of look almost like great whites when you see them sometimes. You oh, see really? <laughs> yeah. That's not a mistake you want to make. <laughs> no. They, 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 and it's one that we, like, frequently do. We, like, look and we see a fin and we run up to it and we like, oh, we thought it was a great white. It's a basking shark, you know. And <laughs> they look very similar and people always do kind of. On the great whites, what is their nutrition? I mean, what do they eat? What do these guys eat? Well, great white sharks, when they're young, they really kind of just gorge themselves until they, so they can grow. So they, you know, their, their main concentration is hunting. And then once they grow, they want to, they, they get this huge body size. So they want to be able to take in a higher caloric intake and, you know, mammals such as seals and stuff have that. So the, the great white, are they like the classification you mentioned earlier about sharks? They're not really going after humans. They're kind of testing. They're looking for other things. Um, well, if you were a great white shark and you were sitting in bad visibility and something quick in a torpedo like shape of a seal passed above you really quickly and you're hunting seals, you'd go check it out. You know, it's human beings that they, 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 they run along the surface of the water. They do all kinds of different activities and this kind of, you know, a shark that forages near shore or is pushing bait near shore or doing anything near shore is going to, you know, see something and floating in the water and investigate it. You know, great whites, have swam next to people a million times and not done anything. It's just, you know, the times that they go to see what something is, you know, there's a mistake identity and then someone gets hurt, ends up on the news and, you know, everybody knows, but they don't know about all the other times where the shark just, Hey, that's not what I'm looking for and swam away because no one noticed that. That's a good point. Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4455. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Somebody mentioned to me a while back ago, they're not really fond of the taste of humans. Is that really, do we know anything about that? Well, we don't, we, we, we... First of all, we're not in that natural, you know, looking of sort of animal that they would like eat to begin with. So at first they're going to see that it's something different. And because these animals are based on like success in their life, you know, goals as far as whatever they succeeded at, they will, they will be like, oh, I caught a seal. So I'm better at catching seals, you know, and they'll kind of like feed off that. They'll recognize that as being a food source, but they won't recognize us. So they kind of just, they immediately see it's not what they want. And they just, like I said, we don't spend a lot of time in the ocean. We're not a water animal. 
You know, if we were a water animal that did all this stuff, I would expect water predators to recognize us, but they don't. And nothing in science says that they do. That's a good point. It's interesting. Do they prefer, when you're talking about seals, it sounds like that's their um, main dish. Is it because of the fat content? It's definitely because the high caloric content is the fat, you know, it's, it's all the oils and everything that is able to make this animal a lot more girthy and large and support this. Yeah, and pl plus their size. I mean, it, great white sharks are able to do that. I mean, they, they have to eat big stuff. They can't just go after small little fish because that takes too much energy. And when you're that big, you can't expend that much energy. You want to conserve it, That's only true. put it out into when you really need it. And how fast do those guys go? Oh, great whites. If I had to guess, I mean, I, they, I don't think they've ever had a like, predetermined. I think they probably, Mako sharks, I know, go to like five to eight body lengths a second. So, I mean, they wow. travel really, really fast and burst. But like a consistent speed has only been really now looked at, you know, where you're kind of like, it's, it's all a guessing game because they never really had anything before that does this kind of stuff. They don't know, like, you know, just recently they've been able to be like, okay, we're enveloping all these different systems and knowing how these sharks operate, but before a lot of it was just, you know, test and go. They'd sit there and put a shark on a fishing line and see how fast it would take the fishing line out and be like, hey, well, this is how much you, but you also have to take into account the animals panicking. It's like pulling from this. It's not, mm. you know, it's, it, how do we know it's, it's re behaving at top speed, you know, or if it's just fighting, you know, they don't, it's hard to determine that stuff, but There's no I would shark say, race track. Yeah, I mean, they get up in speed. They can get up, you know, it looks like 30, 40 miles. So they definitely, they can they can hustle in, in a lot of like, but it's in bursts because they, they have such a body size that they're not able to maintain this for a long amount of time. What about these sharks in South Africa? Are you familiar with the ones out there, the great whites that go flying out of the water? Yeah. What's their they, deal? Uh, <laughs> well, it's called a Polaris breach. It's like... Uh, a lot of sharks do this this hunting strategy. Yeah, they they they'll come from different angles and and try different things and whatever seems to work seems to like work better for them. It seems like in bad visibility things like that you have a better chance of getting those kind of those kind of things because the the animals can't see them coming. So they drag these little seal targets along the side and the shark just sees the seal target and rushes up to try to grab it and misses it or gets it or whatever and they fly in the air. So it's more of kind of like a frantic state. He doesn't want to lose his food until so he kind of yeah. propels up and shoots out. He just wants to be the best hunter he can be. So he's just trying to get himself in the best position to do that. And they know that the best, quickest way to catch these seals is to do it like that. That's kind of and a disturbing thing, isn't it? When you're out in the boat, <laughs> you see these guys flying I think, up. I think it's something exhilarating. I think people, all everybody wants to see it. Everybody wants to see a, a great white shark flipping out of the water. I mean, they... It's their massive size. I mean, a lot of other sharks do this behavior a lot, like I said, but you see something so large jump out of the water. It's like seeing whales or something. You just, but mako sharks do it. Thresher sharks do it. I mean, I've oh, seen really? basking. Yeah, I've seen basking sharks jump out of the water. Basking shark? Yeah. I mean, they're cleaning, they're cleaning lampreys, they believe, off of them. So that when they jump out of the water, they fall onto themselves and slap their body and they're trying to pull off these lampreys. Oh, really? That's what they think. There's nothing been ever, you know, like people, I, I've asked a million scientists what it is, and it's like they're all just, you know, they're, they're like, well, we think this, we think this, we think this. But I don't know. I guess there's no real basking shark breaching <laughs> study going on all the time. I mean, there is some scientists that are studying them and coming across some amazing details, but how often can you catch one breaching? That's true. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, this has been an extremely fascinating interview. we got a few minutes left. we got your special fastball question coming as well. But before we get to the fastball question, what I do want to know is what are some of the tips we can give to people out there um, when they're in the water, when they see a shark? Should they avoid places? Uh, should they really look at the weather report to find out if it's too hot? Maybe you should kind of well, give really, some space. Nighttime. Nighttime, dusk, you want to really avoid because you don't have good visibility yourself. And also the animals are starting to like forage harder because it's closing of the light or the first of the light. You know, so they're they're taking advantage of those low light situations. Plus the closing or the opening of the light kind of gets them amped up a little bit more. They start hunting around the areas and it's like those areas kind of seem to be hot spots. Um, so nighttime, dusk. I would avoid anywhere that where there's fishing or anything going on like that. I would avoid um, 
areas where you can't see very well. You know, it, you want to be able to put all these things in. You, you want to use just really common sense as far as like, you know, is to know that there is sharks in there and what can I do to better prevent any kind of negative encounter from happening? Because okay. in all in all, it's, more, it's worse on the sharks all the time because the shark doesn't accidentally grab a person and all of a sudden report it to all their friends that they did. You know, but we, we, we tell everybody, you know, so it's like everybody has this thing about the sharks where they feel this fear and it's like, it's not really necessary. It's the animals are amazing. They're just big wild animals. You got to know that they exist out there and that's their ocean and you want to respect that. I want to get rid of a couple of myths. I think they're myths. Uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I know there's a couple of techniques that have been bantered around in rumors, hit them on the nose if they're there. Uh, the other one, don't move wildly. Any of those true? If you're in the water and you're moving wildly, you can make something something accidentally think something is something because you're you're thrashing. First of all, you're, you're acting like fish dying or something going on or fish being caught. So they get they react to that sound and the, the everything that goes on. So they'll go investigate it. But there, that's the thing is like if you want to try to react to something that's going on, no one ever does. No one ever goes, oh, I'm being bitten by a shark. It's time to do anything about it. But I always felt like aggression is followed by aggression. Do whatever you have to do to get it out of there, but you know, to get out of the water. But don't, don't like use your hands to put in the mouth, things like that. I mean, I, I would say that you know they, they happen so quickly. Most of the time, no one has any kind of thing to do with this. But oh. you know, they they say in the eyeballs and the gills, all these different things. I personally, I just I don't never known anybody to be like, oh, I did this and it worked. You know, so. I would say that the best idea is just to prevention, you know, first of all, before you even get to that state. And then if it does, I mean, there's nothing really you can really do about those situations. It's like a car accident. You don't think like, oh, you know, do this during a car accident, tighten up your body, you know, and punch your dashboard in the face. You don't do that. So don't, be Steven, uh, don't be Steven Seagal in the water. Yeah. These things just make decisions really quickly. They bite at things and then they just let go. But Sometimes they're more excitable because the other ones in the water it gives them a competitive nature. But you know, they. But at the same time, they. You know, it's all a matter of like what equipment you have to investigate things with, and they have a pretty serious set of it. So it makes for you know. Injuries to the point where you know we're very all over them. Well, there you go, everyone. Make sure you stay away from the water if it's dark, or at least be smart about it, and don't go out there when there's fishing. Another one, right? Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah. Nighttime, dusk, uh, dawn, low light conditions, and bad visibility. You know, you want to be able to know where your body is at. You don't go just to a wall and stick your body into a hole in the wall and go, I don't know what's on the other side. You know, you know that there's dangers in the world. Why wouldn't you assume that there's dangers in the water? It's just, you know, it's like living your life anywhere else. You can get hit by a car more likely up here. You can get crushed by a vending machine. And honestly, you can get bit by another human way there's a chance of you can get bit by another human way more than you'll ever get bit by a shark yeah we it's like totally york, feel that one no i give you a, a statistic in new york city alone there are more shark bites in one year than there is i mean uh, more humans on human bites in one year in new york city alone than there is worldwide of shark bites in a year human bites compared <laughs> yeah shark human bites. beings biting other people just in one year in just a small little place and then you look at worldwide shark bites and humans bite more humans. <laughs> so you're most likely going to get That's bit by your kid or your sister or some of that before you ever get bit by a shark. You know, you someone's going to come at you aggressively and bite you. It's like they, but these are bites that are reported. These are serious bites. Like they have to go down and report a human being bit me. You know, you don't just get bit by your you, you know your kid or something and just go oh I'm going to go report it. You know, but these are. <laughs> These are Holyfield Tyson bites. Yeah, I mean, in those cases, there is an attack, you know? That person knows what it's doing to another person, but a shark, it's just mistaken identity. We're going to give you the fastball question. It's my daughter. She has a huge affinity to sharks, and here she goes. Let's see what my daughter says. Do sharks eat ice cream? <laughs> you didn't hear that. question was, do sharks eat ice cream? <laughs> That's <laughs> so adorable. Um, I would think the ice cream melts, but, you know, <laughs> maybe if we can make ice cream out of fish, then definitely they would eat ice cream. 
Oh, well, there That's you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate it. It's a wonderful insight into oh, the world of sharks. So Such a pleasure. You guys have been awesome. I, I love the ice cream question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably the best one. <laughs> thank yeah. you very much. It's great because we, need, we really need to provide education. We're big on this show to bring clarity to people and try to reduce the hyperbole that goes on out there and give people a better understanding. Nobody better than a shark expert and cinematographer. Got to catch him tomorrow night. Joe, well, people are going to want more information about you. Where do we go? Uh, you can find me on my Instagram, Joe Romero, R-O-M-E-I-R-O, 333. Or you can find me on my website, www.joeromero.com. Or you can tune in to Discovery Channel Shark Week, and you'll probably see some of my stuff up there. <laughs> That's right. Tomorrow night, you don't want to miss Joe. And it, uh, I'll tell you right now, if you go to his Instagram, great pictures. If you're a shark fan, if not, you will become one. Once again, thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, even in the head of a shark, we're going to be there. See you next week. <laughs>